ever tried, ever failed. No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. I would say that the lesson learned for me to anybody else out there interested in starting a business is please find something you're passionate about because it's so much work, it's so much time, it's so much effort. But if the subject matter is something that you, you genuinely love uh, to be involved with, it's, it's not going to be that big of a drag and it's not going to be that big, much work. It's going to be incredibly exciting and, and rewarding because to your point, you'll feel like you're living your, the life that you're meant to live. To punish failure is yet another way to encourage mediocrity because mediocrity is what fearful people will always settle for. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, uh, you're gonna give up. Generally speaking, you should resist the temptation of adding too many features. It's all about either solving a problem or providing a value to, to a user. I think, where is the opportunity? The opportunity li always lies in the place where people complain. Some people sit there complain, you think, mm, if I can solve that complaint, that's the opportunity. If you don't love it, you won't make it through the long period of pain that is inevitable. So uh, make sure that you take care of yourself during the process, make sure that you take care of uh, your mental health, your physical health while you're doing it because it's a long road. And so when we're coming up with ideas, you know, we always ask ourselves, um, what kind of new market is this creating? And then also what, what part of my day and, and what problem is it solving? And so I've gone as far as taking an entire catalog of my day from the moment I like open my eyes and writing down every single thing I do. And then asking myself like, is there something here? Everybody thought we were crazy. Um, we probably were crazy, but having a dream like that, that resonates with people, changing the world, achieving something big, it turns out that's what pulls you through the hard times. Every company has, a hard, has hard times. Uh, every company has setbacks, and it's having that, that, that mountain in the distance that you're trying to scale, um, that is what gets everybody through. So there are a number of decisions that we make every day, and on a product side, there are a billion different features that we could make. So the hard part is really choosing which ones to focus on, which ones to build, and you only have a finite number that you can't actually execute on. So for us, a lot of it is just listening to the community, and more importantly, understanding you know what features they're asking for, but why are they asking for these specific things? What's the root problem they're trying to solve or goal that they're trying to achieve? And a lot of that is based on actual behavior. So not just what they say, but what they do. You need to focus on solutions, not ideas. All of us here are really creative. And we come up with loads of ideas throughout the day. And we become really excited about that. And say, dude, we should start a company around that. But that's when you actually go to the other side, where you talk to, uh, where you, you know, find out what someone um, actually, a, prob a problem that they have and solve that. Is, is when uh, you know, real value comes out. We get to create any company we want, right? We get to create the reason for its existence. We get to create the rules of the game and who we hire and how we hire them and who can stay and who can't stay, right? It's, it's beautiful. And so I just would encourage everyone that as we all contemplate life to try to um, question the assumptions that we live by and the default options that are given to us and expand our thinking to wonder what we really can do with our lives. So today you should think, okay, my co-founders, do we, do we cover a lot of surface area? Do we have different skill sets? And is it somebody that, that I trust fundamentally? 
And that's, those are really, really, really important questions to ask yourself, because if so, then you have a really strong foundation to go forward. If you're gonna start your own thing, you know, maybe you have a grand, grand vision of like all the different features it's gonna have and all the different, you know, revenue lines you're gonna do and, you know, keep, keep that vision, but do one piece of that first and do it really, really, really well. It's so much better to do a few things well than many things poorly. People really love simplicity. So if you look at the problems with large software like Microsoft Office, Every feature in Microsoft Office, somebody wanted at some time. But what happens is over 10 or 20 years, the thing gets so huge, it's overwhelming. So the discipline of great product design is to figure out what are the important cases for the long term and to have the discipline to say no to some things that are good. It's easy to say no to things that are bad, but great product design is saying no to some things that are good. Make sure you choose, you know, when, you, when you're trying to decide whether or not an idea is good enough to pursue or, or a particular business is something you want to you go forward with. Make sure that it's the type of business that when you're standing in the shower, it's the thing you want to think about for the next 10 or 20 years. You can't ever sort of balance two completely contradictory things as a, as a means of hedging. You have to decide what are you going to believe in and put all of your energy behind that. And that's, that's the, those are the kinds of strategic decisions and trade-offs that you make every day as an entrepreneur. And it's important that you create the level of clarity and conviction to go after an opportunity that isn't hedging you know, lots of different ideas or lots of different approaches because that's the surest way that you'll never be good at, at, at sort of anything. And if you're really trying to achieve something, then sort of say, hey, here's my vision. And I like to say, be obstinate about your vision, but be really flexible about your tactics. What does that mean? It's sort of like think big, act small. Uh, what that means is, it's important to have a vision of where you're trying to go. How you get there is a series of experiments. Now you can call them failures when they don't work, but they're learning experiments where you try things, see what works, try the next thing. You're really trying to solve a new problem in a different way. You have to come to problems with beginner's mind, right? Not knowing something can be a very powerful tool into accomplishing it because you don't know that it's not possible. That's what doing a startup is. Not realizing that something is impossible and doing it anyway. Because if you build something for yourself, if you build something that you love, that you think is sufficiently epic, if you make something that you love, there's probably another billion people in the world that love it as well. And what do leaders look like? First and foremost, leaders always have a herd. People always like following leaders. Maybe it's their charisma, maybe it's their personality, maybe it's because they're so in belief of what they say that you have the ability to convince people to buy into your vision, not just for a paycheck. It's something more than that. Because great leaders, they don't only have a herd, they fight for their herd, and the herd knows that. That's your job as entrepreneurs. These are not employees that do your bidding. These are partners that you should bring into your space. And you should be treated like that, and they should be treated like that, with respect and with dignity. Larger, more established entities can't move as quickly as you can. And um, success and scale and size all fight against this. And I would encourage you for the longest possible time as you sort of start your own companies to, to look for ways to stay agile. Uh, values are you know, who you are, right? You don't have personal values, professional values. It's really what you stand for. And again, there's no black and white answer here. There's no right or wrong value. But if you're building a team or building an organization, you want to understand your identity. And then it mostly impacts hiring. It impacts the way that you decide to add people to your team. Um, otherwise, you can become uh, very, very split in terms of what your mission is. And so it's about this movement forward, not what you have own, not your education or your pedigree, not a pile of resources you might have at hand, not your network, just going after this thing and knowing that as you do that, you'll find what you need, you'll make your way over, around, and through. 
And I think the best entrepreneurs that I've met are able to do that because they have this strong vision and they know that it's worth it to keep moving forward. If you're gonna have a breakout startup, you've really gotta think about how you're gonna innovate on distribution, not just product, right? And the, the biggest mistake I see these days that um, I see brilliant startup founders who are brilliant product people and they've really thought about their product, but they haven't really thought about how they're gonna make it grow. And then they launch their product and it's like crickets chirping, no, one, no one's using it. And they're kind of flummoxed as to what to do because they've never really spent time thinking about it. And they just kind of assume that, hey, if you build a good product, everyone's gonna find it. And the reality is it's a big web out there and um, that's not necessarily true. You know, I think what I see right now is people wrap up their sense of success and identity with their prowess in fundraising and comparing themselves against how their peers are doing. Uh, I think that's really the wrong way to, to look at things and it, and it leads to uh, kind of non-optimal outcomes. Um, for instance, I don't know if the valuations that companies are getting today is necessarily healthy for the company themselves. And for us, again, you know, our inability to raise capital actually forced us to be very disciplined in how we think about the operational metrics of the company. And that's allowed us to, uh, you know, be pretty successful. So you know the most important thing you can actually advise yourself or anyone else? Is ignore your mistakes. Like, what is your problem? You're good at some things, just go do that. The number one thing you should worry about is am I doing the things that I'm good at? For somebody aspiring to you know, take things to the next level or to even surpass their wildest dreams, there's always going to have to be an element of luck, but I think more important is putting yourself in a business that can be ubiquitous, that, that, can, that really doesn't have limits. Because otherwise, there's always going to be a grind to it, but if, if the business, if, if, if it can't be something that you can visualize every business using or every consumer using, it's going to be tough to scale to be big enough or to have the perceived value. The two things we really zero in on on people are, um, you know, two things. They sound simple, they end up being very difficult. Um, courage and genius. Um, courage is the one we talk about a lot because it's the one that people can learn. Um, you know, courage, courage, which is to say not giving up in the face of adversity, um, you know, just being absolutely determined to succeed, you know, is something that you can, you can like force yourself to do. It can be very painful, you can force yourself to do it. The genius part is a little bit hard to force yourself to do. Um, you know, courage without genius might not get you where you need to go, but genius without courage almost certainly won't. I think that's what people always have to ask themselves. Do you believe in the concept of what you're doing? Do you believe that there's really a there there? If you can figure out the right you know, product package or the right way to reach users, and if you believe that, then you know, keep, keep scrapping because usually there's a way. Don't solicit feedback on your product, your idea, or your business just for validation purposes. Be really careful about that. You want to tell the people that can help move your idea forward, but if you're just looking to your friend, coworker, husband, wife for validation, be careful because out of love and concern, a lot of people will express some concerns and it can stop a lot of multi-million dollar ideas right in their tracks in the beginning. And I got, can't stress this enough, choosing your partners has got to be maybe the most important decision you'll ever make, whether uh, you know, personally in, in, in love or otherwise in business. You can change your idea, you can pivot your company, you can't change your partners without starting over. And so I see so many people rushing into these relationships. I mean, you should really give that a lot of thought. This is something that hopefully will last years. So many things go wrong when you're starting a company, and often I think people ask, you know, what mistakes uh, should you avoid making? And, you know, my answer to that question is don't even bother trying to avoid mistakes because you're going to make tons of mistakes, right? And the, the, um, the important thing is actually learning quickly from whatever mistakes you make and not giving up.
Right, and I mean, there, there are things every single year of Facebook's existence that could have killed us or made it so that it, it just seemed like moving forward and making a lot of progress just seemed intractable, but you just kind of bounce back and you learn and um, nothing is impossible. You just have to kind of keep running through the walls. You have to have an emotional investment in what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, um, Failure is pretty much guaranteed. Success is not guaranteed by any means, but failure is m much more likely if you don't love what you're doing. Um, and you can do that in a good way and a bad way, but hopefully if you try to get people to motivate why they're doing something and their way of thinking, you know, the worst thing you can end up with is a situation where um, you get told, well, this is the way it's always been. That's the worst ever, that's a non-answer. Instead, ask yourself, you know, given everything we have today, is there a way we can make this better? I think people that look for great ideas to make money, uh, you know, aren't nearly as, as successful as those who say, okay, what do I really love to do? What am I excited about? What do I know something about? you know, what's kind of interesting and compelling. It's uh, very rewarding when you work on something you think is going to make a big difference. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but I think, uh, I think the passion that one might bring with it uh, brings so much more energy to that, that you're more likely to succeed. But ultimately the biggest thing, and what I still, still spend from a third to a majority of my time on, is hiring. Uh, nothing has the impact of uh, getting the right people around the table. And you can't manage your way out of a bad team. If you know exactly what you want to be, you need to spend as much time with people that are actually that already. Do something you're very passionate about and don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. If you're not coming up with 10 ideas a day, that's why I have this thing. If I'm not coming up, if I'm not filling up this page every single day, then my idea muscle will atrophy. And I started this in 2001, and I still do it every single day. Like you have to come up with ideas every single day or the idea muscle atrophies. The good news is after about six months of doing that, you're like a machine. Like people get surprised at how many ideas you could just have anywhere. Uh, and so some of the best I got, advice I got was from uh, Paul Graham, one of the investors in Stripe, uh, who, who talks a lot about unscalable strategies for user acquisition. Uh, say, for example, you helping each user personally. Sure, that won't scale as you grow to a very large size, but when a startup is just starting out, uh, it, it really helps you have an advantage as a small and nimble company. So just go and do it, try, learn from it. You, you know, you'll fail at some things, but that's a learning experience that you need so that you can take that on to the next experience. Um, and don't let people who you may respect uh, and who you believe know what they're talking about, don't let them tell you it can't be done. Because often they will tell you it can't be done, and uh, it's just because they don't have the courage to try. When it comes to changing the world, what I learned from Steve Jobs is if you believe in a Macintosh, if you believe in iPhone, iPod, iPad, if you believe enough, then you will see it because other people will believe in it. Other people will create software. Other people will create products. So you need to foster the belief in what you are dreaming so that it becomes a reality, which is very different than saying, I don't expect anybody to believe it until I see it. You need people to believe it before they can see it. 
don't necessarily think that you have to have the home run and the huge Apple computer on your first start. I spent a long time in my life with skills just building little devices for fun. For fun is one of the key things because that drives you to think and think and think and make it better and better and better than you ever would if you're doing it for a company. Build things at first for yourself that you would want. You have to decide if you're going to be a slow growth company or a get big fast company because anytime you try to straddle uh, those two lines, painful things happen to you. You know, to create a business, you've got to initially work day and night, weekends. It's really hard work. I've always thought that each person invented himself for whatever reasons, through whatever circumstance, through whatever he has gone through, that we are each a figment of our own imagination. You know, I often say this would be 12 people at the table, right? And we're having a discussion about something. And something may turn up that could be an opportunity. Half the people don't recognize it's an opportunity. A lot of people are comfortable in what they're doing. They don't want change. People actually get into a zone where they're very comfortable. So they, they don't like the idea of risk. So how do you start a business with no money, under the worst conditions, that your backer doesn't want to give you a dime? What do you do? Get ready for a lot of rejection, and at the same exact time, do the things others don't want to do. Do what's necessary, do what it takes, no matter what it is, and try not to hurt anybody along the way. Develop the habits. You've got the brain power, you've got the energy, but develop the habits of success. From day one, I just, I never tried to hide that I was the girl in my apartment with the red backpack. It's like, this is who I am, and um, I find that people end up rooting for you and opening more doors if you're really honest early on. Some people start businesses and try to come across that they're much bigger than they are because they feel like that's the only way they're going to be taken seriously. But if you know your product's great and you know why you made it, you don't have to apologize for being out of your home or your apartment or being small. I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I cared, that's what I cared about. I cared about solving problems, being successful. Anytime an obstacle presented itself, I used it to my advantage and made it work. And I never heard the word no. If I heard the word no, it meant maybe. Then I made maybe yes. In the end, uh, luck plays a very important part in how successful you are, but the harder you work and the longer you work, the luckier you're going to be. You have the power to just, I mean, you can sit down, you can code something, you can try it. You, it doesn't matter to you whether someone thinks it's a good idea or not, because you have the power to go put that online and, you know, and see whether it resonates and connects with people. Stay focused on, on the stuff that, that, you're, that you're providing to your users. You're going to make a ton of mistakes. It doesn't matter. You don't get judged by the mistakes. People don't remember those years from now. They remember the things that you did that were good. Basically, the theory is we're all born thinking like entrepreneurs. You know, like when we crawl and we, start, and we fall, uh, you know, when we're trying to walk, we figure it out. Entrepreneurs always figure out you're born thinking like an entrepreneur that, you know what, I'm going to figure this out regardless and I'm going to keep going. Now, often the challenge is families and friends convince you not to be an entrepreneur because when you say I'm going to change the world, I'm going to be the most famous person, I'm going to save the seals, they say don't do that. You, it, it didn't happen before. Yeah. You, it's never happened. You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to fail. You're going to embarrass us. They put the limiters on it. They put the limiters on it. Yeah. They put the blinders on you, but true entrepreneurs will just keep figuring it out. And you know what everybody wants to hear? What they already believe to be true. And so the last thing they want to hear is an original idea that contradicts their belief system. So it's very hard to even bring that kind of stuff up. But those are the things, those are the only things, things that you believe that everybody around you doesn't believe. When you're right, that 
create real value in the world. Everything else people already know. There's no value created. It's just business as usual. So it's so important to think for yourself. Um, I think my biggest tip is just get started. Um, I meet a lot of young entrepreneurs who have good ideas or bad ideas or some ideas uh, and you don't want to be a person who just talks and talks and talks. You have to actually go and do something and don't worry about uh, if it's the perfect thing or not. There is this myth of entrepreneurship that you'll have the one genius idea and suddenly everything falls into place. It doesn't work like that. It's a hard slog. There's a lot of things to do wrong, a lot of things you'll do right. Um, the sooner you get started, the sooner you'll get somewhere. I don't have the same opportunity as you do. Yeah, you do. You do. You have every bit the opportunity that I did. And so you can go out there and do it. Somebody said, well, what was your goal? Goal, make money. People need to understand that we cannot take a breath, that we have competitors who want to take the food off of our table. We have an economy in which there's 8% unemployment here, 9% unemployment in the U.S. And Starbucks Coffee Company is not something you have to have. It is a discretionary purchase. And so the mentality that you need in a business today, Starbucks or otherwise, to build sustainable success and enduring success is you have to eradicate the human behavior of relaxing the human behavior of feeling like we have won. And what I have said in the last two years of Starbucks is there's no celebration, there's no victory lap. We haven't done squat. There's always going to have to be an element of luck, but I think more important is putting yourself in a business that can be ubiquitous, that, that, can, that really doesn't have limits because otherwise there's always going to be a grind to it but if, if the business if, if if it can't be something that you can visualize every business using or every consumer using it's going to be tough to scale to be big enough or to have the perceived value to get you to that billionaire club what fear is stopping you in your tracks and burning the soles of your feet what if conquering that fear, whatever it is that keeps you from being what the Creator intended for you? What if you could unleash everything great in your life? Would you do it? Would you say yes to that? New companies generally shouldn't exist. Um, um, existing companies are usually pretty good at what they do. Um, and so for a new company to exist, it not only has to like, you know, come in go, you know, go into business and bring a product to market, but it has to bring a product to market that's so much better than what already exists that it punches through the sort of status quo. I grew up under a premise. Uh, go in an industry that has a large profit margin. Don't go in one that's slim. Go in one that's large. Take what you've got. Your assets are your energy. Your assets are your willingness to just not be told no. The harder it is, the tougher it is, the bigger the challenge to get in, the bigger the opportunity behind. Uh, the opportunities behind are endless. Don't allow anyone, friend, family, acquaintance, teachers, whoever it is, don't allow anyone to tell you that what you are dreaming for yourself and your family is not possible. It is possible. Don't be one of those people 20 years from now are going to be walking around in a 9 to 5 job miserable and angry and bitter. You know, one of the things that I tell people when they ask me for advice about what they should do when they're wanting to start their own business uh, or take a next step in their career is to actually start small. I think a lot of people try to, um, they kind of psych themselves out or they get too overwhelmed with how big something can get. But the truth is, you really just got to start small and you got to prove it before you scale it. I like to see people. I think it's really important, even if it's 10 minutes, 
I hate all this new world of people are talking. So I like the idea of seeing people. I think you get a very different view when you look in somebody's eye. You, you, you know in a second whether it's right. I mean, I see these people, they're like eight yards away at a desk and they're busy. I said, go and talk to them. Why are you emailing each other? Go, go have the conversation. What happened before email? People spoke. Hello, good morning, how are you? Companies like Google are not getting rich on user-generated content. They're getting rich on the content of companies like Viacom, and we're not going to put, put up with that. We're not going to put up with people taking our product and not paying for it. They want our product, they can have it at the right price. Things that really didn't pan out, and yet some things will come through. I use the term gold, gold rush rather than mania because I, I am a firm believer that what's going on at the heart of it, it is very important. Uh, so there is gold, uh, it may be buried very deep, it may be buried in different places uh, than uh, people think it is, uh, but it, it, it's a great thing. This is an area where our country is way out in front. You take almost every aspect of, of what this entails. The, fiber optic switches, the software, the chips, the uh, content uh, coming from media companies, and the opportunity to set global standards and have global markets. Every country I go to, uh, the biggest concern I hear is, how far ahead is the U.S. of my country? Well, since we don't have deregulation, in a, in a sense, we're not really at the starting line. Uh, and, and so I'm certainly a fan of moving ahead aggressively. A company is simply a group of people um, and uh, as a leader of people uh, you have to be a great listener, um, you have to be a great motivator, uh, you have to uh, be very good at praising and looking for the best in people. Um, you know, People are no different from, from flowers, if you water flowers they flourish, if you um, praise people they flourish and, um, and that's a critical attribute of, um, of a leader. Now, Apple, fortunately, is one of the half a dozen best brands in the whole world, right up there with Nike, Disney, Coke, Sony. It is one of the greats of the greats, not just in this country, but all around the globe. And, but, but, but even a great brand needs investments and caring. I'm going to put the vast majority of my energy, attention, and dollars into building a great product or service and put a smaller amount into shouting about it, marketing it. Because I know if I build a great product or service, my customers will tell each other. You have to mix in some patience with that. The education is so much more widely available. There are now so many more people both here in the Valley and around the world who now know how to start a company. Um, and that, again, maybe sounds obvious, but like it, when I arrived in the Valley in 1994, like I went to the bookstore and I tried to find a book on how to start a tech company. And like, it was a long and lonely trip through the bookshelves. Like it, <laughs> there was very little. I mean, luckily Andy's, Andy's book was there, but Andy's book was about how to run Intel, which it was a monopoly. I didn't, couldn't really get a lot of benefit out of that for my startup <laughs> at the time. Um, and so, like, the, the resources just simply didn't exist, right? And today you've got, you know, it's everything. You've, you've got, to a lot of it comes out of Stanford. So, like, this, it's the CS-183, just the CS-183 course at Stanford that the various people have taught, Peter taught, and Sam Altman has taught, like, and, and then the fact that those classes are not just accessible to people at Stanford, they're accessible to people all around the world. And there are people all around the world watching, right, those, those videos all the time, learning how to start companies. If you're thinking about starting a company, it therefore really stresses an idea, and again, I'll use my, I'll use my Peter Thiel on the shoulder uh, thing, channel this through, something Peter says that I think is really relevant, which is a lot of founders think about what it takes to get the second person in the company, right? The second founder or the second engineer, right? Or the third person, the fourth person. He says, that's no longer the challenge. Like everybody wants to start a company. And so everybody can get together two or three or four people to start a company. He said, the challenge is how do you get engineer number 20? Because engineer number 20, right? If they're in this ecosystem, they could go start their own company. And so how do you convince somebody to join your company as engineer number 20 with a tiny percentage of equity, right? And, and not being in charge as compared to starting their own company, getting all the equity and being in charge.
charge. Now, one of the things you do is you tell them they're going to have the same problem, but then they respond to you that you also have that problem, and then you sit there and stare at each other <laughs> uh, <laughs> awkwardly. Um, so, 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 so that that's the thing. So, so what you have right now is you just have you have you have just a very, very large number of seed-funded companies that are experiments, and they're experiments on their ideas, but more importantly, they're experiments on who has the will and the drive and the horsepower, right, and the salesmanship and everything else that goes into recruiting. Right, um, and so, and, and, and every, I think actually Sam Altman gave a talk the other day. He said if you could wave a magic wand, you would combine a lot of these companies together to get critical mass. But mergers between startups almost never happen for a variety of reasons. And so, so it, it really it makes this sort of acute. This this recruiting problem is a very acute problem. By the way, you think about it then as a rec the temptation is to think about it as a recruiting problem, which is we have to get really good at recruiting. But it's not really that as much as it's like okay. What about my company is going to be so spectacular and so special and so unusual and so distinct and differentiated that it's going to be able to easily hire engineer number 20 away from starting his or her own company? Um, and so to me, it basically translates into basically we just we, you have to get better. Like you just have to get better. You have to be able to compete and you have to be able to win in this really brutal initial battle. The good news is the company's coming out of that sort of churning kind of you know uh, uh, sort of uh, you know sort of snake pit of competition. The companies that come out of that are really strong because they had to be uh, to come through it. But it, it it is tougher and it is the other side of how easy it's become to start to start the companies. Again, this is um, it's again another version of this market. Uh, so you always um, you know it's again you can, uh, you have a lot of big markets where you have sort of inch deep, mile wide uh, type uh, type products and. Uh, and uh, payments is always is sort of a version of this, where uh, where um, one of the big challenges is, you know, how do you get the first people to use your product? How do you get the people to use your your new payment system, for example? Uh, and so it has to be really valuable to the first people who are using it. And so you want to find things that are, you know, where there's a very intense need. You know, PayPal was like, well, the power sellers had to use checks. You could get the money instantly, so you should cut the time from seven to ten days to to instantly. That was worth that was worth quite a bit. Um, in many other contexts, we already have payment systems that work as uh, that work pretty well or very well. And if you have something that's perfect, that's only a small delta to very well. And, um, and you know, you always you always say that you shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the very good. Um, I think in business it's often the opposite, where in, in practice the very good uh, will prevent the perfect from ever arising. So if you have things that are working very well uh, and you have something that's going to be theoretically perfect, um, that's often a really bad idea. You know, I, I think it's kind of in life, a lot of times when people are down, they look at how to survive while they're down, but stay at that survival mode long term opposed to, I'm going to learn how to survive right now and make it, but I'm immediately going to work towards the next step, the next step, and the next step. Well, so, I mean, so how did you learn? How did you learn how to be a successful entrepreneur? Well, I don't think it's learning how to be a successful entrepreneur. I think it's just being able to do something and know that you have that ability to do it. You see, the human race has the ability, all of you do, to do 10, 50 times what you're doing right now. Well, if you realize you have that ability, as you go along, you find obstacles, but you overcome them or you go right around them, like water might go around them a little bit. And, and that's really it. You look at what assets you have. It's a little bit like selling, whether uh, it's a tangible product or a service. It's got to be the very best. And you put forth its features and then how it benefits the customer. Well, with yourself personally, you put forth the features you have, how these features might benefit. And if you have a product, uh, and I'd love to share this with everybody, don't ever go into the selling business, whether you have the greatest service in the world or the greatest product. Never go in there to sell your product. Go in there to be in the reorder business. That's kind yeah. of your mentality. That's true. Yeah, that's because true. if you're going to sell it, that's where your focus is. If you want to be in the reorder business, even if it's a one-time product, whatever you do is so good that they'll want to tell somebody else or reorder themselves. Right. So that kind of helps along the way if you have that mentality. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That's the basis for most religions, but they get sometimes carried away in rites and rituals. But that's the core value. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. And then it's the feeling of knowing from how genuine you are, and because people don't like to just listen to people talk about themselves, how great they are, they want to know how incorporate it to make them successful also, or do something a little different, and I think that's very, very important. And 
I find, even with myself, that it's really hard to do a minimum viable product that's minimum. That you're constantly thinking, no, no, it really has to have this other part, and it really has to have this. And then you overbuild, and then you have to unbuild and debuild, <laughs> which is very disappointing. So um, doing a minimum viable product is really important, and it's even more minimum than you think it is. Try to do something that you would want to do anyway, whether it's uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a very successful business because um, when you do decide to become an entrepreneur and start a business, chances are it's not going to do it's not going to become like a multi-million dollar business. So at least do something that you love in the beginning, so that even if it fails, you'd still enjoy it.